All right, it's time for us to begin this morning. Appreciate everybody being here and appreciate uh, those who are with us online. Uh, as we said, today will be our, for those, our members here, uh, today will be our last class in here together. Uh, we've been doing for the summer talking about uh, dinosaurs and man and what does uh, history and science say about that. And we're going to end with that today and then next week uh the kids will go back to their regular classes. Uh, all those uh, 18 and below or however that age breaks down uh, will go back to the regular classes. The adult class will be in here. Um, and I believe we're going to study the book of Ephesians. That was uh, a suggestion to me. If anybody has any other thing they'd like to study, uh, let me know. Uh, but I believe Ephesians where we're going to go next. I don't know if we'll be there next Sunday, uh, but we will be there uh, shortly after. Now, as we've talked about dinosaurs and man, we, we began the last few weeks talking about fossils and talking about the existence of fossils and, and what those fossils prove and what those fossils point to. And so uh, today we go to another part about this idea of fossils, and that is this idea of fossil layers, because this is a key teaching of evolution. And the problem is that evolution and evolutionists say that the fossil layers ought to be uh, in a certain order. And when that's not in that order, there are major issues and problems that, that, that they have to go through gymnastics to try to disprove. Now, let me explain to you what, what happens here, and, and I'll move to the side so I can look at the picture. What fossil layers say, or what the evolutionists say, is that these fossil layers are formed over millions of years. And every fossil layer takes thousands to millions of years to form. And so what they say is this bottom layer here, and you'll notice this picture. Notice the picture and the organisms in this picture. You'll notice at the very bottom, they're little very simple, very uh, singular little organisms. Nothing developed, nothing like an animal, nothing like a mammal, a reptile, a fish, anything uh, uh, of any significance. That next layer, there's a little step up. There's the mollusks. There's the things with the shells and the outer, uh, the outer protection. And they're a little bit above the, the single cell organisms, the basic organisms. But they're not to animals, not to fish, not to mammals. They say you go up, and again, as you go up, you notice these skeletons, you notice the pictures, that as you go up, you go further and further, closer to more advanced, more, more developed animals. And so what they say is that this fossil layer proves evolution. That evolution says that the simplest of animals are down here on the bottom, and the more complex are at the top, meaning time has passed. And so what they will do when they dig out fossils and they find fossils, they will find out which layer of the earth that it is in, and that's how they'll go for a date. Because they'll say, okay, this is the date of when this, this animal existed, or when this creature was alive, or this, uh, this plant and so this is a major thing they'll do, and they'll talk about these fossil layers. And again, uh, I didn't fix the picture, but if you'll, uh, you can remember uh, that when we had that last week about the Grand Canyon or any kind of natural canyon wall you see, rock wall, you can see these layers. You can see how it's divided up, and that's how they dig these fossils up. The problem is there are certain things that do not follow this fossil layer pattern. One thing that has caused evolutionists all kind of problems are things like this right here. Because what you have right here is a, this right here in the middle is a fossilized tree. Evolutionists say that it takes millions of years to layer up this, this, this dirt that would cover this up. So according to evolution, if evolution is true, for this tree to be fossilized like it is, and you see how, how tall this tree is, how much rock is there, for this to have happened according to evolution, this tree had to have lived or had to have been upright in, in some kind of form for millions of years. This tree had to be standing perfectly still, didn't deteriorate, didn't rot, and allowed the dirt to pile around it and that dirt to harden and fossilize and cause the tree to fossilize. 
And you see, anybody with any sense knows that's not how it's going to work. Trees can live 100 years, a couple hundred years maybe, but it's not going to survive millions of years. And it's not going to deteriorate, not going to not deteriorate. It's not going to not rot. It's not going to have any problems. So what happens? What causes these trees to do this? Well, what's interesting about this, 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 this tree, and, and again, this is just one example of trees that we find that go through multiple layers of the, of the, of the earth, is these trees prove that the fossilization happened very quickly, it happened in a shorter amount of time than what evolutionists will try to tell us to say. And therefore, it points again to the idea of what we talked about last week with the Grand Canyon and those natural formations, those dinosaur graveyards. It points more to a catastrophic major event, more so than a gradual happening over time. Because evolution says that time... As these layers form, these layers form, we talked about this last week, as in a uniform pattern. It uniformly goes up. It uniformly changes. That's the idea of evolution. Is evolution is constantly changing and it's constantly going up. And it takes time to do that. This tree causes a problem. It throws a major wrench in their belief because this tree is going through what they consider millions and millions of years of rock. To form. Well, what would cause this? I said a minute ago, this would fit better with the idea of a major, sudden, catastrophic event rather than a prolonged event of taking millions of years. And if you don't remember last week, or those who weren't here last week, the major catastrophic event we're going to say that would have caused this is the flood. That idea of the whole earth being flooded and the dirt being packed and compressed around these trees. And again, that creates this fossilization problem. Or it creates this fossilization, not problem. It creates the fossils. It creates this problem for evolutionists because they can't explain why trees are sticking up through multiple layers of earth. And it's not only trees that have caused this problem. Another thing that has caused this problem is a whale. In, in, in I believe it was the 90s, I forget the exact time, there was a whale skeleton that was found in, I believe, Massachusetts, somewhere in the northern eastern United States. They found a whale fossil, and this was a, a huge whale. And what this first picture is, is this is what happens to the whale. The whale would have died on the land upside down. And they can tell this by the way the, the, the skeleton is uh, is. Or, is organized as the way it's portrayed. Uh, then you notice that as that skeleton laid there, it decomposed, and this would have been the, 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 the fossil, the skeleton, not, not the fossil, the skeleton of the, of the whale. Now here's where it gets interesting. This, if it would have stayed right here, this would have fit with all the ideas of evolution, all the ideas of uh, the fossil layers are, are stacked, they're not moving, they're not causing any issues. The problem is, when they went to find this, this, this whale skeleton, the whale skeleton had actually shifted. What had happened was there was certain microbes that are in the whales that, that, that were part of what ate the whale, that ate through the dirt, and it caused this whale skeleton to shift and to go down into the dirt and thus create this vertical fossil. Now again, what's interesting about this is the idea of how quickly this would have taken place. Is this uh, would have happened very quickly. And again, this whale, and you know the idea of whales, uh, what caused this on the side? Uh, the diatomic, uh, diatomic guess. I can't say it. Uh, but this is California. I have my notes here and I lost it. It's California, not, not Maine. Uh, but this is a whale that was found, and it went through multiple fossil layers. And it created this issue of why it went through the different layers of the fossils. Because, again, those, those layers of rock are said to have formed. And then when they formed, it takes millions of years and millions of years to get through those layers for anything to wear. Remember, we talked about the Grand Canyon last week. 
how they said it would take millions of years for a little bit of water to, to dig out the Grand Canyon. This would have took, according to their theories, millions of years for this skeleton to have went down into this rock like it did. But it didn't. And what I bring these points up to show you, this tree and this skeleton uh, and this whale, is to point to the fact that the fossilization process is not a long, drawn-out process as science has tried to say for years, but it is actually quite a fast process that when the elements are right, when oxygen is taken out of an area and the rocks are compressed and the dirt is piled in, fossilization can happen very quickly. That would explain why a tree, again, a tree that, that we notice, uh, we have a tree that falls in our yard or falls in the woods and we go check it uh, week by week and month by month, we see that tree start to deteriorate. We see it start to rot. We see it start to go away. Uh, it doesn't form into the stone. Uh, this stone process is something that happens. So again, that tree that went through those layers of rock couldn't have been something that, that took millions of years to form. It had to form a lot quicker. So what we see is some proof that the fossils are not in a geograph are not in a chronological order. Again, evolutionists want to say that you start at the bottom and go to the top from least complex to most complex. That as you progress, the animals get more developed, more, uh, more, developed, more uh, complex. That's not the case. And many times they found these skeletons all mixed in together. Uh, and, and so the fossil layer points to the idea that, again, the fossilization didn't happen over millions of years where animals died and were slowly buried and slowly covered up, but it points more to a catastrophic event that caused these skeletons. Now, one last thing real quickly about these dinosaur graveyards and these skeletons that some people say, well, well why are the human skeletons not uh, found with these dinosaur skeletons? Well, there's a probably, uh, well, there is a good answer for that, I believe. Uh, because, and, and the interesting thing about this is the Bible will tell us this without ever, the Bible tells us the answer to this without saying this is the answer to this problem. Now, here's what I say. Dinosaur graveyards have been found throughout all different parts of the world. And they'll say they have all these different dinosaur skeleton graveyards, uh, dinosaur fossils, but they don't have human fossils right beside them. The human fossils should have died and should have been buried the same way. Why are there not human fossils with these dinosaurs all throughout the world? Well, we have to go back and ask the question, where was man at? According to evolution, man had not evolved yet. We know, according to the Bible, God created man with the animals. But the Bible does tell us where man was. Anybody know where man was during this time? When the dinosaurs spread throughout the world, where was man at? Man was still in the Middle East. Man was in one small geographical area. You know how we know that? What happens after the ark? What did they decide to build to go toward the heavens? The Tower of Babel. And what happens at the Tower of Babel? God confuses the language and disperses men where? Throughout the whole world. It's not, again, the idea is it's not until the Tower of Babel that man starts to spread throughout the world. Man seems to be located in a small geographical area. Now here's where this ties in dinosaur graveyards. Guess where no dinosaur graveyards have been found yet? In the Middle East. In that area where man would have been, they haven't found any. They found them in Asia, they found them in uh, quite a few in America, they found them in South America, Africa, in every spot, but they haven't found any there. And it would make sense why man wouldn't be found there because man seems to be located in that geographical area. And again, that's the whole idea. They didn't go far. You, you read the, the, the first nine chapters of Genesis. Man seems to stay in that area of the Middle East, of Israel, and, and that small geographical area because it hadn't grown that big yet. It's not until the Tower of Babel that we really see man forced to spread and go throughout the rest of the world. The rest of the world. So that would explain that. Now, for the next part, or to end this lesson, to go to our last part of this uh, in this series, I want us to talk about living fossils. I want us to look at some animals that have fossils that are, quote unquote, millions of years old. But yet, the animal we see in the fossil is the exact same, or nearly the exact same, 
as the one we have today. Let me explain. Let me, let me show you a picture. The first one we're going to look at is this right here. This is called the chambered nautilus. This is a marine creature, a little marine uh, mollusk. It has a hardened outer shell, and its outer shell has about 30, 30 spirals to it with the small uh, mollusk-type creature inside of it. This creature is typically said to have been, you remember those layers, is typically said to have been one of the bottom layers of evolution. This is supposed to be one of the earliest creatures of evolution. That they say that a lot of creatures, a lot of things that we see today, uh, came from, from this creature. That it evolved. Now, here's what's interesting. This is a picture today from our oceans of this um, chambered nautilus. And here's the fossil. The fossil of this chambered nautilus is the same function, same design, same everything. And they say this nautilus, this fossilized nautilus you see before you, is hundreds of millions of years old. Well, here's the question. If evolution is true, then why do we still have chambered nautilus today? If they evolved and they developed, and again, it's not just one creature. Every creature, according to evolution, has to evolve, has to go up, has to move up. Then why are these creatures the same? If they are supposedly to have evolved, why do we have creatures today that are the exact same as the fossil record? That doesn't make sense. That doesn't fit with evolution. And this is not the only creature. Let's talk about one that's a little more familiar to us, a dragonfly. Do you know there are fossilized dragonflies? The fossilized dragonfly. Now, now here's, here's the interesting one. I'll go ahead and show you this. Uh, this is the fossilized dragonfly. If you can see it, you can see the wings here and the body here. The interesting thing about this creature is this creature is, I forgot how many times, but it's quite a bit larger than the dragonfly we have today. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think this dragonfly, the body of this dragonfly was, was six to eight inches or so. Uh, this is one of the biggest dragonflies ever found. And you have this dragonfly that is huge. But here's the interesting thing. When you compare the fossil record of this dragonfly, this fossilized dragonfly, with the modern-day dragonfly, aside from the size, they're the same. They have the same design, the same function. And you'll notice I'll use the word design. Evolutionists won't use the word design. It has the same design. It looks the same. It functions the same. The only difference is size. And, here, and here's where this, this, this dragonfly goes against evolution. Evolution says you go up, you develop, you improve. Well, why would a dragonfly get bigger in the fossil record, but yet in modern day it's smaller? The idea is the bigger you are, the more you'll survive. The more you'll do, the more you'll progress. Again, how can over millions of years dragonflies have quote-unquote evolved, but yet a dragonfly, dragonfly fossil from, again, hundreds of millions of years ago be the same as the dragonfly we see today? How can it have evolved in any way and be the same creature today? It doesn't fit. Not only that, this is the other thing about this. Uh, evolution goes against its own science laws. There is the law of, oh, I forgot the name of it now. Uh, the law of biodynamics, I believe it is. Uh, anyway, it's very similar to the Bible principle that says animals produce after their own kind. Meaning that if your dog gets pregnant, and you know it's about to have uh, babies, you're not sitting there looking at the dog saying, okay, dog, what, what kind of babies are we going to have this time? Are we going to have cats? Are we going to have dogs? Are we going to have cows? Are we going to have sheep? And if we said that, then we would get tickled. We'd think, oh, well, that would be something Austin would say or Connor or one of our little bitty kids. 
No rational adult would say that. But do you know that's what evolutionists have to say? Evolutionists have to say that at one point there was a dog that gave birth to something that wasn't a dog. Something totally different. Something totally different than its parent. That is not documented. That is not shown in anything we see. And again, this is where this is key. Look at the fossil record. They point back to the fossil record. These dragonflies, these chambered nautilus, are the same creatures today as they were all those years ago, thousands of years ago by our understanding, by the flood reckoning, that they were today and they were fossilized. They weren't changed into something new. And that would explain why they were not made into something new. Here's another interesting one. This goes back to the, the, and again, you'll notice these first three or four creatures I'm showing you. These are basic, what they consider basic lower creatures. Creatures that should have evolved into something different. And these creatures should have no longer been in existence. The next is one that you may have seen yourself uh, when you go to the beach. Or if you go to an aquarium, the horseshoe crab. And this horseshoe crab that you'll see populate in certain beaches, you'll see them in the water sometimes. Uh, underneath the horseshoe crab, I want you to show you this picture uh, because this is going to be very important. Notice this picture. Notice how the horseshoe crab, its outer, skull, outer shell is there, its legs, its tail. You see, this is a modern picture of a horseshoe crab upside down. Now, this is where this is important because look at, this, at the fossil remains. This is a fossilized horseshoe crab. Again, notice the same curve of the shell, the same tail, the legs. And again, this fossil, according to our modern scientists, is millions of years old. But yet this creature hasn't changed. We still have horseshoe crabs today. We still have this same creature that is alive today, same function, same everything, but yet it survived for millions of years without changing? That doesn't fit the evolutionary pattern. Here's another one. Look, let's go a little bigger. The modern-day crocodile. The modern-day crocodile, what scientists will sometimes refer to as the nearest living relative to the dragons or to the dinosaurs we have today. The closest resemblance we have to dinosaur. And they'll say that because they'll say that the crocodiles and dinosaurs never, uh, they, they were two different creatures. Now, the interesting thing about it is that they'll say that during the time of dinosaurs, hundreds of millions of years ago, that crocodiles were alive. There were crocodiles, and there were alligators. They know that because of this. There have been fossilized remains of a crocodile or alligator found. And again, you look at this skeleton. This is the fossilized remains of a crocodile. And you look at that idea of that creature compared to well, that creature. And you'll see they are basically unchanged. Although millions of years supposedly separate the fossil from the life. But yet it hasn't changed. It hasn't developed. It hasn't had any kind of things happening to it. There's another one. Uh, the alligator gar is another creature. We, again, we sometimes see these today. Again, we know what the alligator gar looks like. We have pictures of it. You, you see it in the rivers we have even around here. Uh, I remember growing up that there were people who would, would, would fish the alligator gar, or if they caught one, they'd be upset because they didn't want it. Uh, and, and you look at the alligator gar of how it's made and how its body is, it, all the things about it. Well, guess what? There's a fossil of an alligator gar. And that fossilized alligator gar is the same as the alligator gar we have today. Same function, same body parts, same skeletal. Everything is the same. Everything is just like it was in this quote-unquote millions of years ago. 
Now let's go to another creature. This is an interesting one. This is the, uh, the Laotian rock rat. Now, this creature is interesting because this creature was said to have, ex- to have been extinct millions of years ago. That this creature, this rock rat, is said to have developed into a weasel-type creature. That it evolved into a weasel. And there were skeletal remains of these Laotian rock rats because, again, these rats were a little different than uh, the other rats. Now, here's what's interesting about this creature. They found fossilized records of it, and I don't have a picture to fossilize uh, what this Laotian one looked like, but for hundreds of years, this creature was believed to be extinct until about 15, 16, 17 years ago, around 2005, uh, there was a guy in uh, Laos, I believe it's it where he found it, that in the wild, he came across a picture, or he came across this creature, and he photographed it. He photographed it and began to do research. He thought he had found a brand new rat species. But as he began to do his research and began to study this creature and the other creatures around it, that, that he found a colony of them, and, and as he began to study them and look at them, what he found was a creature that science thought was extinct was still alive. A creature that science said had been extinct for millions of years, and yet it was still alive, and it was still the same as it was in those fossilized records. One more living fossil I want to look at. And this is the most interesting and probably most well-known of all the living fossils we'll talk about. And I'm going to see if I can get the name right, because this is not an easy name. This is the coelacanth. The coelacanth is a fish that for millions of years, who are evolutionists, had been extinct. That is until about 1933, there were some fishermen off the coast of Madagascar. And they caught this big fish. They caught this fish that that they didn't know what it was. They didn't recognize it. And they began to do research about this fish. And they began to try to figure out what this fish was. Well, the interesting thing is as they were trying to figure out what this fish was, these fishermen began to catch more and more and more of these fish. Meaning it wasn't just a rare occurrence. There, were, there was a school of these fish there. Well, they began to say these fish and began to try to figure out what this fish was. And they realized what this fish was was actually this coelacanth. And it was from the fossilized record. And again, this is the, the fossilized record of, of this uh, coelacanth. And for, million, or for, for the period before this, this, the discovery of this fish, this fish was said to have been the missing link. That this was a fish that connected uh, fish to reptiles. And they say that because if you look at this fish, you'll notice these fins down here on bottom, and I'll show you the actual fish in a minute. Uh, you'll see these fins on bottom. These fins on bottom were more rugged, more defined than typical fish. And so scientists said, well, these were the beginnings of fish developing legs. Because again, that's what evolution has to say. Evolution says that you have a fish, that fish develops legs, and that fish with legs then walks out on the, on the, on the land, and as it grows and it develops, and it has offspring and offspring and offspring, it starts to lose its fish parts, and the fish parts become more reptile parts, and then eventually that reptile becomes more mammal-like, and, and, and so forth and so on, and, and, and this is where this is what evolution tries to teach, and this, is the, and this is the thing about this to me. This is what our world says is scientifically true, that these creatures had to form and become something totally different, although there's no proof, there's no evidence. What was interesting about the, the coelacanth was that they said for years, this was the missing link. Here's the proof. This fossilized fish became an amphibian until they started catching it. And we go back to those guys at Madagascar. They caught it. And a matter of fact, in the time, in, in nearly the 100 years since that point, these fish have been caught all throughout the Indian Ocean. 
And you again notice these big fins on bottom. They said that was proof that these fish were different than other fish, and this was the legs they were going to form and they were going to make. Now, <clears throat> here's another thing this fish does uh, against evolution. Evolution, our evolutionists teach that this fish is the fish that walked out of the water on its two legs or four legs to become amphibians and reptiles and so forth and so on. The interesting thing, that the funny thing about this fish, the reason this fish lived so long in the ocean without anybody figuring out where it was or anybody knowing it was still alive, is these fish, even today, they rarely, rarely, and, and this is one of the rare occasions when the guys in Madagascar caught it, they rarely come above the 500-foot mark, meaning that these fish don't come above the 500-foot below water. So you've got to picture your ocean. If the ocean floor to the, to, the, to the waves is less than 500 foot, you won't find the coelacanth. They don't like that shallow water. They like the 500 foot and below. Meaning what? These were in a deep ocean. These were creatures that were in a deep ocean that, that didn't like the shallow water. But yet evolutionists, for years before this, said this is the, this is the fish... That they found out now don't like shallow water. But this is the fish that eventually evolved where it went into the shallow water. And not just into the shallow water, but climbed out of the shallow water and began to shed its fish parts and become an amphibian and become a frog and become the animals we see today. Now, the other thing about this coelacanth that is a problem with evolutionists is the size of it. Uh, again, I don't know if you noticed this picture, but look behind that fish. Do you see what's behind the fish? Now, that's the reason why I chose this picture. There's a diver behind the fish. There's a diver. You can see the head, the body, and the feet. Now, again, I don't know how big this diver is. It may be a, a, a teenager. Maybe a, it looks like a woman of some sort. So again, it's not like a, a full six-foot man. But you've got a woman behind it who, again, at least five, five, six. And you look at her compared to this fish, and they're pretty close. These fish are huge. But yet evolutionists want to say these fish crawled out of the water, and they became frogs. They became tiny animals. Again, it doesn't meet the idea of evolution. Evolution is you go up, not down, just like the dragonfly. If the dragonfly evolved, why was its ancestor so big and the one we have today so small? The answer to the dragonfly we can find in the flood. Again, we look at the world. The Bible presents the idea that the world was different before the flood and after the flood. Before the flood, there was this time when men lived longer, animals would have lived longer. And I told you about this one of our very first lessons. That most reptiles, as long as you let them live, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Again, you talk about people who go crocodile hunting or, or people who look at alligators, they can tell you how old an alligator is by how long it is because an alligator never stops growing. Insects are the same way. The longer an insect's alive, the bigger that insect gets. And you look at that idea of that dragonfly, of how the dragonflies we have today compared to that dragonfly, and you consider how much longer it would have lived. Now, that was our bell to be done. Let's bring this whole series to a conclusion. Why have we done this? Why for these weeks have we taken the time to study this about dinosaurs and about evolution to know the truth? Very simply this. Our kids, we have been conditioned to think that man and dinosaurs could not live together. I've shown you proof from fossilized footprints to art to drawing to various records that point to man and dinosaurs living together. But evolution says dinosaurs and man cannot live together. And because of that, the famous evolutionist, I told you this in the beginning, Richard Dawkins once said, if there was ever evidence, ever proof, that man and dinosaurs lived together, the theory of evolution would be disproved. But we've shown that proof. 
The science world refuses it. It's interesting. You can take these very things that I've told you this week and I've told you in this class and go look them up on the Internet, and you'll see just as many people say, oh, well, this is a, this is a hoax. This is a hoax. This isn't real. But you look at their explanations. Their explanations don't work. Their explanations are, don't hold water because they refuse to believe that there was dinosaurs and man together because if that's true, then evolution's wrong. And if evolution's wrong, then the alternative has to be true. And the alternative is that there's a God that created this world and everything in it in six days. And if that God is real, and that God is true, and this is where this is key, if that God is the God that created all this thing, then we ought to find out what that God wants us to do, how that God wants us to live, and how that God wants us to act. That's why evolution is so pre prevalent today. That's why atheism is so prevalent today. Not because they, they think it's right. Because to say that there's a God means I have a moral obligation to follow that God. To say there's not a God means I can do what I want to do, how I want to do it, however I want to do it, without any regard for anybody else. That's why this is important. Because these facts point to the, this, these pictures, these, these facts points to the idea and points to the fact that there is a God. He created the entire world, and he has a plan for each of us to live for. Real quickly, I want to end with some, some bonus stuff. Because I was given some pictures of some people y'all may recognize. At least one. Miss Irene gave me pictures from their travel. And I want to give you some ideas. You, you can see, I think this is the fact of picture. She may get mad at me. She's coming in. Nope, nope. I'm at the wrong slide. Here we go. This. This is Miss Irene. Again, this is, yeah, you, you see, if you don't know how tall Miss Irene is, she, she's back there. Look at her, and then look at the dinosaur bone. This is how big these creatures were. And then this is another one. This is another familiar face that some of you may know. Uh, again, I believe the book said this was a, a shin bone that, that they had stood beside. And these are pictures they took when they went to that uh, dinosaur park. Uh, we talked about this last week, the dinosaur monument. Uh, and so what I want to bring all this to you to see is these are pictures that she took where she saw these fossils and she saw this layer. And, and, and these are the things that she saw, again, that, that point to the fact these, again, these fossils are real, but how do we explain them? And again, that's what we've done this whole class is talked about what these fossils were, how they formed how they would have been, again, to prove that evolution is wrong. It didn't take millions of years to form these. In fact, it was a lot shorter time. It would have taken a very short amount of time. Again, I can't give you an exact number of how many times it would took, how much time it would have took, but the flood would solve this problem. With the flood, the water, the dirt pressed upon it. And so I just wanted you to see these pictures uh, from Miss Irene uh, that were of, of these different fossils against them. Uh, I'm sure if you want to see these, you can talk to her. She's got a big book. Uh, it's just a few pages of this of one of her trips that she sent to me. Uh, but that's it for this morning. I appreciate everybody's attention. Uh, I hope you've learned something in this class. Uh, again, I want you to see how important this class is because we have been trained to think that dinosaurs and man cannot live together. If we believe that, then we begin to doubt the creation account of the Bible. But if we believe the creation account of the Bible, then we'll see that dinosaurs and man could have lived together, and they did live together, as we've shown in this lesson. Uh, we're going to stop right there. We'll take a few-minute break, and then we'll have our morning worship. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. We have visitors with us, and we'd like to welcome uh, them to uh, the services today and to encourage them to return any time they have the opportunity. Also, uh, keep in mind that there are the uh, some of our congregation is, is at the Tilden congregation observing their friends and family day. Betty Jeffcoat, Molly's sister, is in hospice care at St. Francis Hospital in Bartlett, Tennessee, and the family requests uh, your prayers. Uh, let's remember also Miss Mary Frances Clifton, who's recovering from the, the virus. Uh, Cindy Jeffcoat Wood is recovering at home. Donald Roberts is in the Meadows Rehab. Dorothy Wildman, Karen Collins' mother, is in the Meadows. Carrie Ligon, uh, a friend of Irene Osborne, is in rehab. Arlene Gray is having health difficulties. Uh, Sherry Rockards having health difficulties. Randy Holly is recovering from surgery. Sophie Grubbs, who is with us today, is uh, recovering from, from health difficulties. Doyce Delaney has cancer. Nellie Coker is with us, uh, dealing with the, the, her health difficulties and, and surgeries. And if there are any others who are dealing with sickness or or our difficulty, please uh, let the congregation know so that it can be of assistance. Don will be leading our singing this morning. Dwight Rackard will read our scripture. Eddie Harden will word our opening prayer. I'll uh, preside over the Lord's Supper and Richard Comer will provide for our closing prayer. Please continue the uh, remembering the announcements that uh, are the other services that are being streamed and on YouTube. And are there any other announcements that need to be made? We'll now begin. Number 203, hallelujah, what a Savior. And of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came through blind sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior! Guilty, foul, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring, then anew this song will sing, Hallelujah, what a Savior. He lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. 
He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see His loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that He is leading through all the stormy blast. And day of His appearing, and come at last. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him. The help of all who find None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. Today's select scripture is Second Peter 1, 3 through 15. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent as long as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure you will be able to call these things to mind. Bow with me, please. Our almighty and all-knowing Heavenly Father, we stand before you today with so much thanksgiving for the many blessings and the many opportunities that you give us each day. May we ever be mindful of where those blessings and those opportunities come. Father, we pray today for those who have been mentioned on our sick list, prayer list, those who are undergoing treatments, taking tests, in the hospitals, those shut in at home, recovering from sicknesses and surgeries. We pray that you would be with each one of them and their families and comfort them as only you can. We'd ask you, Father, to be with the church here and the leadership, that you would guide them, the direction that you would have them to go, and all that we do would be done in a biblical way. Father, as we continue into our Worship today, we ask that you would be with Brother Matt as he brings a lesson, that he might present it in the way he has planned, and it might fall on eager and listening ears. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The invitation song will be number 255. 255, I am resolved. You'll mark that in book and then turn to number 237. His grace reaches me. If you would, stand with me as we sing this song together. Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is 
is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sent from the Father, and it thrills my soul just to feel and to know that his blood makes me whole. His grace reaches me, yes, his grace reaches me, and twill last through eternity. Now I'm under his control, and I'm happy in my soul just to know that his grace reaches me. Higher than the mountains and brighter than the sun, it was all heard at Calvary for everyone. Greatest of treasures, and it's mine today, though my sins were as scarlet, he has washed them away. His grace reaches me, yes, his grace reaches me, and will last through eternity. Now I'm under his control, and I'm happy in my soul just to know that his grace reaches me. Good morning. It's good to see everybody out again and see everybody with us and glad to see those who are online with us this morning. Uh, don't forget this afternoon at 5 p.m. we'll have our uh, family Bible study night. Uh, for those who want to come back, uh, we'll have a, a potluck style meal and then we'll have a devotional thought. Uh, and then tonight we will uh, pack envelopes for our FBI class. We'll uh, send out the advertisements for that, so if you can come out and help us out with that. And then after we're done with that, if you want to bring a game or you want to bring something to do, uh, we're more than happy to, to do whatever we want to after we finish those activities. So, uh, But just wanted to let everybody know again that, that tonight at 5 o'clock, uh, we'll start back our, our family Bible studies now that we've uh, gotten through the summer and, and get back in that routine of having those uh, a couple of times a month. Uh, today for our lesson, we're going to look at the topic uh, or the next topic in our book, and that is the idea of living life in view of eternity. Living our life in the view of eternity, in the view of, of seeing what is waiting for us. As we were thinking about this lesson and we are looking through the book, they gave an illustration, an, uh, an old preacher, uh, that some of you may, may not know the preacher, but you know who he, probably know who he baptized. Uh, but there's a famous preacher, or, or a gospel preacher, I not say famous, uh, who used to preach in Walker County, Alabama, around Jasper for many years by the name of C.A. Wheeler. Uh, C.A. Wheeler is known in the brotherhood uh, because he is the one who taught and, and baptized many people, and, and one of the people he baptized was Brother Gus Nichols, uh, that well-known preacher in, in that area of Alabama, and I assume in this way too. But Brother C.A. Wheeler would always get up, or he would typically get up and introduce his lessons, and when he would start his sermons, he would start it this way. He would say, brothers and sisters, fellow travelers from here to eternity. And as he began that idea, we're going to take that last part of that phrase and focus on it and think about it, where he talked about this idea that we are fellow travelers from here to eternity. You see, that reminds us of who we are. It reminds us that we are people who are not residents here. 
We are not people who belong to this earth. We're not people who are a part of this world. Instead, we are temporary. And as we're going to look at this morning, we're going to see in the Bible the idea that we need to keep in mind that we are temporary. We are traveling. We are not here. This is not our focus. Our focus is on something else. And that's what puts Christians different from everybody else. If you got your Bible, you can turn with the Second Peter. We're going to look at mostly the book of Second Peter and see where Peter will also address this topic. He will address this topic to us to remind us again that we are not here for eternity. That we are not here forever. Our life on this earth is temporary. And everything we look at, it, we look at all the verses, all the different ways the Bible will talk about life, it will talk about life as temporary, as a vapor, as a mist, as a brief moment. And we look at that idea of that life is temporary here. And because it is temporary, we ought not to look at this life, but look to something else. To look to something else as our God, and to look at something else to get us ready for what is next. And that's what we're going to spend our lesson this morning talking about, that idea that we have to use our time here to prepare us for eternity, and that we should have lives that are lived in anticipation, being ready, being hopeful, being lookful, yearning, or that home of heaven that will promise to us one day. Let's begin first by looking at the idea that we are not here forever. You know, when we think about the idea of eternity, and we think about the idea that eternity and what that word implies, it implies a life that goes beyond this life. It goes. It refers to a time that goes beyond just our temporary thoughts. And again, when you think about eternity, and you truly try to comprehend eternity, it blows your mind. Because there is nothing, nothing on this world, in our life, in our existence, that we have a part of that fits that description of eternity. And I'm meaning eternity as we typically think about it, as a one way. You know, when we think about eternal life, we think about eternal life as a one-way life. And here's what I mean. We know our life when it began, and we know when our life on earth will end. Well, eternal life says that our life has begun, but our life will never end. And you think about that for a minute. Although we may think our life is long, we may think we've been here a while, and we've still got plenty of years left on this earth, we don't know. We can't grasp the concept of something that never ends. Ends. Try to grasp that for a minute. Think about something in your life. Here's a challenge. You want to challenge your, your mind to grasp eternity? Try to think of something that never stops. That never stops. That it continues from here and goes on forever. No event, no thing we have starts right now and doesn't end. But that's the promise of eternity. And here's the thing about it. Here, here, here's what really blows your mind is true eternity, true eternal being with God, means it never started to begin with. It's always been here. You think about God, everything in our world has a beginning and it has an end. This world, whether you believe in evolution or whether you believe in creation, there is a time when this world existed and this world didn't exist. Then it came into being. And the idea is this world is going to come to a time that's no longer going to be here. Even this world we're in, this universe we're in, has a time frame. But eternity has no time frame. And I say all that to say this, to, to get you to this point, that when we look at the idea of eternity, we ought to realize that it's not wrapped up in this life. It's nothing about this life that is eternal. Because everything in this world, everything that we do, everything that we, we partake of in the world, and in a worldly standard, is going to end. One day it's going to cease. And what we need to live for is that we need to live and realize that there's something beyond this life. Because as I said in our class this morning, evolutionists and atheists, they live a life where an idea that they say that when they die, their life is over. They may not say that, they may not verbally say it, but that's their belief. That there is no life after this life. Once their life is over, it's over. So therefore they can live and do what they want to do. But we realize we're not here for forever. Notice where Brother Dwight read for us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, or verse 15 first, where there Peter says, And I make every effort 
Notice this. I make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Peter says that his time is coming up. Notice that the time of my departure, or after my departure, Peter knew he was going to die. Peter knew his life was going to be over, but he wanted the Christians to know, to be able, to be faithful even with him not there. Peter recognized his time was short. We go back to the verses before where Brother Dwight read for us too in verse 13 and 14. Peter also talked about his earthly dwelling. And he understood that his earthly time was limited. Again, notice verse 13. And I think it is right, as long as I am in this body, notice, as long as I am in this body. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Paul talks about this tent, this earthly dwelling. The idea here is that sort of the idea Peter has. That the tent, that the body we inhabit, the body we live in is a tent. A tent. What does a tent imply? A tent implies temporary. If anybody would have known that, it would have been Paul. Paul was a tent maker. Think about this. You may enjoy camping, and you may enjoy going and living in your tent. Uh, some of us, if we go camping, we'd rather have the camper or the cabin. But if you go camping in a tent, how long are you going to go? A few days? A few weeks? If you're adventurous and you're traveling a bunch of places, maybe a month. But how many of us are going to say, you know, I'm going to sell my house and sell all my possessions, and I'm going to go down here on the south side of town where there's an empty field, and I'm going to live in a tent. For the rest of my life, I'm going to live in a tent. What will we say? You're crazy. It's not what a tent's for. A tent's not made to withstand the storms. A tent's not made to, to withstand the weather. A tent's not made to be living in forever. A tent's temporary. That's what Peter and Paul want us to see about the body. Our earthly body is temporary. It's temporary. It's passing. Some of us, it may be a short time. Some of us, it may be a long time. We don't know how long our tent will last. Notice what Peter says here in verse 14. Uh, we'll continue in verse 13. He says, As long as I'm in this body to stir you up by way of remembering, since I know, now notice this, since I know, that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. Well, he's referencing there is probably John 21, where John, where Peter tells, uh, where Jesus tells Peter that he gives the insinuation that John's going to be the last one alive. And Peter says, "I know I'm going to have to die. I know I'm not going to be here when Christ comes back." And he says, "My body, the putting off of this body is coming." And so Peter shows us here in these first few verses of chapter 1 that he has the body that is temporary. But there's a parallel. There's also the idea of something better. If you go back, if you're there in 1 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, go back to verse 11. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, Peter says, For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance to the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He talks about there, we're going to read that, we're going to read the verse before this here in a little bit. He talks about our faithful life, how we add to the add to our faith knowledge, and so forth and so on. We'll talk about those when we get there. But notice the end of this. He says, For this for in this way there will be will be future tense. The entrance into the kingdom. We know the kingdom, the church, is a kingdom that, that sort of blows our mind because it's a now but not fully. There is the kingdom we're a part of now, but it's not the full kingdom that we will see one day. That the heavenly entrance into that heavenly kingdom is the final, the establishment of that kingdom. And this is what Paul, Peter's talking about here when he says, it will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom. That kingdom is coming. And notice something else about this verse that Peter says, and, and I know I've made this point before, but I want to make it every time I talk about this verse. Peter says here that the entrance into heaven is not something you're going to slide by. You know, I can't tell you how many faithful Christians I've had. You ask them, are you going to heaven? I hope so. I think so. If I get in, it'll be by the skin of my teeth. Or if I get in, it'll be because I, snake, I snuck behind Peter's back when he went looking. I snuck in the door as they were closing the gate. 
We say that sometimes uh, sort of tongue-in-cheek to be funny. But as Christians, we should never have that doubt. As we are faithful Christians, Peter says the gates of heaven will not just be open, they'll be flung wide open. All those who are to be there will be there. There's no doubt. And Peter says, I know I have an eternal kingdom waiting for me. Paul will say back in, first, in 2 Corinthians 5 that there's a house, a building made by God waiting for me. And they go back to, first, uh, to 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, you'll see Peter's parallel, or Paul's parallel. Paul says this body's a tent, but I have a house with God. Meaning what? The house is permanent. The house is lasting. The tent's temporary. Peter says the same thing. He says, I know there'll be richly provided an entrance into the eternal kingdom. He says, but for now I'm in this body, this body that is passing away. And again, this body will lead us, if we're that faithful life, will lead us into that abundantly supplied, that gates flung open entrance into heaven. No doubt about it. And again, there's that future that is to come. And because of this and because of these words, we can look to the future that God has a promise for us. You know, it's sort of an interesting thing to me. I don't know if you've noticed this or heard about this yet, but, but there's a, a new old teaching starting to make its rounds, especially in some parts of our brotherhood. Uh, about the teaching of the kingdom came in 70 A.D. and there is no heaven, there is no uh, no, earth, no 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 new heaven, new earth, and, and that's uh, something that again we could spend a whole time talking about it. But it's it's very odd to me uh, why people would take that kind of position because they take that position and they sort of downplay that there will ever be a heaven that this life is it, and they miss the point of what Peter says here because Peter says that we look forward to the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven, a new earth we'll live at, a place that, that's new, that's different, that's unlike this heaven in this earth. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, he says, but according to his promise, talking about God, we are waiting, we are waiting for a new heaven and new earth, or new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. You see, we have that hope of the promise of God. And again, remember the word hope in the Bible is not the hope that we may have. You may, I may talk to you at church and you say, well, I hope I have a good lunch. Well, you say you hope you have a good lunch. What is that contingent? Well, it depends on what my wife wants to eat or what my wife may have fixed me if I have a good lunch or not. That hope that we talk about of I hope I have a good lunch is a wish. I wish I did. But when the Bible speaks of hope, and we have this hope as we speak of here, it is according to a promise. It is a knowledge that knows that it is there waiting for us as long as we remain true and we remain faithful. Because you see, that's the idea that God wants us to see, and that affects our life here. You see, I say all this to point to this because with our Christian life, we have to live a life, as we talked about in our lesson at the title, we have to live a life that lives in a view of eternity. We are living for a place beyond this place. And to get there, we have to live to the standard of God. Because, you know, in this world, this world says there is no life after this world. There is no life after this life. Just do what you want to do. You want to go... Uh, have a good time with your friends, drinking, driving, partying with drugs. Go have fun. Just don't get caught. You want to go have a relationship with, with whoever you want? Do it. Married and unmarried, the, the same sex as you or not, uh, whatever they are, go have a good time. You may suffer a little bit in this life, but after this life, it's over. But God shows us. Peter reminds us that there's a hope beyond this life. There is a life that goes beyond this. And we have to realize that when we have that hope of living for eternity, it changes the way we live. It changes the way we suffer. It changes the way we deal with hardships. Why? Because we have hope. 
When we have a loved one who gets cancer, or we have a loved one who dies suddenly in an accident, but we know we believe they were faithful to the Lord, we have a hope, don't we? We have a hope that one day we'll be with them again. We have a hope and we have a loved one who's dealing with the disease now that we can be there with them, we can help them as we are, but we can know that when they, when they die, they live that faithful life, and we live that faithful life, we'll see them again. There's a hope that changes the way we live because, you see, the world says live for yourself and don't think about anything else. God says live for eternity. Live for that eternal home to be with God where there'll be no death, there'll be no, no tears, no heartache, none of those things. We have to live for the future. And we have to realize there's something waiting for us. As Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18, For I consider that the, time of suffer, that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul says that the suffering we go through here pales in comparison to the glory that we'll get one day. You see, we live our life focused differently. We're not focused on here and now. We're focused on tomorrow. We're focused on the hope that is before us. For we know that along with the idea that the righteous will be blessed, the righteous will get the new heavens and new earth, the wicked will also be punished. <clears throat> those same people who believe that I can live and do what I want to do without any recompense, one day will be mistaken. One day they'll be called out. One day they'll stand before the great and almighty God. And they'll stand before Him in that judgment seat and He'll tell them, depart from me. First, our second Peter chapter three verse seven. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of the a day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. The day of judgment, the destruction of the ungodly. The ungodly is going to perish. There's a day of judgment that is coming, and as such, we have to think about where we are. Because we look at places like Second Peter chapter nine, uh, chapter two and verse nine, where Peter will talk about the godly and the unrighteous. Verse nine, he says, "There then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and how to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment." You see, we have to here realize that that day of judgment is coming, and as it's coming, we have to prepare for it. It's our next point. We have to prepare for that time that's coming. Because again, it's not something we're just going to happen into. We're just going to wander into it, accidentally get there. To be with God, to be in God, to be the righteous is a choice. A decision we make. A decision that God knows and God acknowledges. And God will take care of us. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 10 through 16, following the next verse, Peter there will tell us that the unrighteous waste their time in this life. They waste their time indulging the flesh and its corrupt desires. Listen to what he says about this world in 2 Peter 2, verse 10. And especially those who indulge in the lust of the defiling play a passion and despise authority. Boldful and willful, they do not tremble as they are, as angels, though greater in might and power. Do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are they are ignorant, which also which will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as a wage of their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling even reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way that they have gone astray, they have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved gain more from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. 
You see, he begins to describe here what's happening to these people. And I want you to notice a few key words here he talks about. He says, one, they are def- they, they indulge the lust of defiling passions. They indulge their self-lust. They indulge their self-sinful side. They do what they want to do, what makes them feel good. And notice they despise authority. They are bold and willful. They do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. They blaspheme God. They blaspheme His Son with no fear, no worry. And notice what he says in the next verse. He says the angels don't even do that. The angels are afraid to accuse them. Nevertheless, try to blaspheme and accuse God. Then in the next few verses, he said they're like irrational animals. They have no thought. They have no plan of the future. They just act for the here and now is the idea. Then verse 13, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime, meaning that they, that, that they enjoy things that people typically do in the dark. You know, there was a time when there were actions and activities that people did after, after, uh, after dark or in the dark because they didn't want people to know about it. And the more and more I read this, the more and more I see our world fits this description to a T because what has happened to us, even in the last 20, 30, 40 years I've been alive, I've noticed things that at one time you didn't do, you didn't tell anybody you do, Now, we do it all the time with no fear. And the thing about it is that our social media has influenced that even more because not only do we do it during the day, we post pictures about it. We post videos about it. We boast about it. We say, look at us. Look at what we're doing. There's no shame. There's no fear. And notice what it says again. They are blots and blemishes. Reveling in their reviling in their their deceptions while they feast with you. Notice what he says here. Notice this last part. They are blots and they are blemishes while they feast with you. Meaning what? He's not just talking about the world outside. He's talking about Christians who act this way while they're with us. They're quote unquote Christians. He says it ought not to be this way. And then notice what goes on the last few verses. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin, meaning they're never full. They go after sin, after sin, after sin, after sin, and they never stop. They forsake the right way, he says. They have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, who was paid to come prophesy against God's people. And remember, God told him, don't say anything I say, but Balaam went anyway. God told him not to go. You know the story, the donkey that stops him in the road, that prevents him from being struck down by the angel of God. And remember, he beats the donkey, and the donkey finally speaks to him, and basically the donkey says, man, are you crazy? Don't you see the angel of God who's there ready to kill you if I didn't stop you? And then God tells him, I told you not to go, but since you went, you go, but you don't speak except what I speak. And you see, Balaam gives the prophecies about how to be, a, or prophecies about God's people, but he doesn't curse them as Balak wanted him to. He blesses them. But then you later find out that Balaam tells Balak, hey, you want to get the people? I can't curse them, but I can tell you how to defeat them. He says, get them to turn to idols. Get them to turn away from their God, and their God will rebuke them. And that's the very thing we see in the book of Numbers. But he says they're like Balaam, refusing to listen. Refusing to pay attention because they're so wrapped up in self. However, we should not be that way. We should be people who use our time wisely, who look to the future. As one way of putting it in the Bible, the idea we ought to be wise. You know what the difference between a wise person and a foolish person is? A wise person thinks about the future. A wise person looks not just to what's right here in front of me, but how does this affect me tomorrow, next month, next year, ten years down the road? Yes, this may be something simple, something easy right now, but what is the future effects of it? And a wise person will look at it, and if that something is not going to be beneficial to them, if it's harmful, if it's sinful, the wise person will go around it. The foolish person is presented with an opportunity no matter how evil or how vile it is, because it's something they enjoy right now, they jump in as we say both feet. No question about what the future holds. As Christians, we cannot be that way. 
We have to think about tomorrow. Think about eternity. Think about what is waiting for us. Again, notice again, Second Peter, and we look at the idea that our new heavens and new earth is waiting for us, but we must be diligent to get it. We must be spotless and without bl- or and blameless. Excuse me. Second Peter three verse fourteen. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by Him without spot or blemish and at peace. We must strive to be without spot, without blemish. We must strive to be the people God's called us to be. Now again, notice we should strive, be diligent to be found. Doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. Doesn't mean we're not going to fail and mess up. But we're going to do our best to be that way. We're going to do everything we can. To be able to be that diligent person, number one, we've got to find the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. That salvation that is promised by that new birth. That new birth that John told Nicodemus about in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Where Nicodemus comes and he talks to Jesus at night in John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then Nicodemus replied and said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, does Nicodemus really think that's what's going to happen? No, but Nicodemus is confused. He wants to know, Jesus, what do you mean, second birth? How is this going to work? And then he knows verse 5. And Jesus said, Truly I say, or truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Paul will go on to tell us that new birth happens when we imitate, we reenact the death, burial, and resurrection. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 7. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ Jesus, uh, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one, whom ha- for one who has died has been set free from sin. Notice what Paul and Peter, or Jesus and, John, and Paul are talking about here. This new birth creates a new person. This new birth, as John, Jesus is saying in John 3, creates a new person. Just like a birth, as we talk about some of our members, some of our loved ones that are getting ready to have babies. That's going to be a brand new person. It's not going to be like any other person that's lived before. It's a new person. The same is true when Jesus says that unless someone is born again, they become a new person. Paul will say you become that new person when you die to the old self. That you're buried in that water grave of baptism. You rise to walk a new life. A life that prepares for the future. A life that is different than the life we lived before. And in being a different life, we have to develop our spiritual lives. You see, to be ready for the kingdom of God, to be ready for heaven, we have to develop our Christian life. I told you earlier, we're going to go back to 2 Peter 1, that list of graces. Listen to this list. Begin with me in verse 3 of 2 Peter 1, verse 3 through 11. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason... Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Notice some things about this passage. Number one, through His power, through God's power, God has given us everything we need. Everything we need, God has provided for us. God has told us all we need to know. God has showed us all that we need to know and understand to be His faithful children. Number two, in verse four, our goal is to become partakers of the divine nature. Do you realize that idea of eternity is not our nature? Our physical, bodily nature is not divine or not eternal. That when we enter into eternal life, to get eternal life, we have to become like God. We have to become part of His nature. To be like Him, we strive to become eternal. To have an eternal nature like God. And in order to do that, in order to get that goal, notice this next part, we must not remain the same, or must not remain at the same spiritual place. We have to develop. We have to grow. We have to move. Here's the idea. If you look at your Christian life and you are the same Christian you were this day two months ago, or you're the same Christian you were a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty years ago, or maybe you're less of a Christian than you were then, you're going the wrong way. Unless you can look back at your life and say, you know, I can see my growth. That's why Paul says in those verses, verses 5 through 7, to grow. Add to your love, add to your grace, add to knowledge, add to all these things, add to your virtue. You're to develop. To grow, you look at that list, and we can never be perfect. And that's the idea. That's the idea. It's not that we finish one step and go to the next. It's not that we'll ever have the idea of self-control completely under our control, but we can be more self-controlled, and that leads us to the next step. You see, we're constantly growing. We're constantly developing. And if we're not, if we're not, Listen to this very closely. If you are not growing, you are dying. If you're not growing as a Christian, you're dying. Same as a church. No church, no church ever plateaus. We may plateau number-wise, think we're plateauing, but if you really look at the idea of a church, a church never plateaus. A church either grows or dies. When you plateau, you may think you're holding your own, you may think you're doing good, but guess what you're actually doing? may not be that great of a dangle, may not be that great of a shift, but if you're plateauing, you're going down. You're dying. Same with a Christian. We can never say, I've reached a spot, I'm right here, I'm good. Or as a Christian, we can never say, I've done my time, I'm finished, I'm too old for this, I've done all I can do. No. No, no. No matter how old, no matter how young, we must grow every day. And that growth enables us, as verse 9 says, to be fruitful, to be effective, to make our calling and election sure in verse 10. And when we do those things, he says in verse 11, we talked about earlier, the gate of heaven will be slung open for us. There will be no doubt are we going to heaven. We'll know where our eternity is. Because we are living for it. We are preparing for it. And when we have prepared for it, when we live that life of preparation for heaven, we'll be able to do our last part. When we have a view of eternity in our life, our life is a life of anticipation. Our life is a life of anticipation. Here's what I mean by a life of anticipation. Remember the last time you took a big family vacation? Remember the last time you went on a big family trip with your kids? And your kids were counting down the days? I'll never forget last year, we went to Disney. And Austin and Elizabeth, months beforehand, how many days we got left? How many days? How many days? How long we got now? How close are we now? Are we about there? Are we leaving tomorrow? No, no, we still got a few weeks. Why were that way? They were anticipating that trip. They were ready to go. They were ready. Are we as Christians ready? 
Do we look to heaven, to eternity with anticipation? Now, again, I, we, I say this with this caveat. I'm not saying, uh, as the old preacher story goes, that, that a preacher stood up one Sunday morning and asked the congregation, who all wants to go to heaven? Raise your hand. And the preacher story goes, and everybody in the church raised their hand except one old man sitting in the front row. And the preacher was perplexed by this. He said, well, maybe the man didn't hear me. So he spoke a little louder. He says, everybody wants to go to heaven, raise your hand. Well, again, everybody raised their hand very high this time except that old man. And this time he said, well, I'll make sure I get his attention. He said, everybody who wants to go to heaven, stand up and raise your hand as high as you can. He said, everybody got up, raised their hands as high as they could except this one old man in the front row. And the preacher was thoroughly confused and perplexed about this one man sitting in the front row that, that wouldn't answer this question the way he thought he would. And so the preacher said, I just had to file that back, and I had to go on my sermon. He preached his sermon. And he finished his sermon, and as he was going out, the old man walked by him, and the preacher said, i got to ask you a question. And the old man said, okay, what is it? He said, I asked who all wants to go to heaven. He said, everybody said yes but you. He said, why did you not say yes? And the guy said, I want to go to heaven. He said, but I was afraid you were handing out tickets this morning. You see, that's sort of the idea we want. We want heaven, but we don't want it now. You see, that's the idea of that anticipation. We have to find a balance. A balance that shows that we enjoy this life, and that's not ungodly. It's not wrong to enjoy our life, enjoy our family, enjoy our friends, enjoy our passions, enjoy our hobbies. But we also have to live with the waiting for tomorrow. The anticipation that when this life ends, that's okay. When this life ends, I'm fine with that. And you know, we see this truth, and I'll make this point when we get back to our lessons and our points. This point becomes very clear to me every time I talk to someone who has a terminal ear illness. Because you know, every time you talk to a Christian, let me say this, a Christian who has a terminal illness, you know what most of them will say? I'll miss my family, I'll miss my life, but I'm ready. I'm okay. I'm ready to go. Now, you talk to their, their, their spouse, their children, their grandchildren. No, we don't, want to go. we don't want this to happen. Well, why? That person has anticipation. The suffering person sees the end. They know their trip. As Peter says, my time is short. They know it's over. And they know there's something better waiting for them. But the loved ones have to live longer. You see, we have to live a life with anticipation. And you see, when we live a life in anticipation, as we say here, we can face the challenges of this life. As Paul said, the sufferings, the hardships of this life are nothing when compared to the eternity that's waiting for us. The eternity. The idea that we're promised a life with no hardship, no sorrow, no pain, if we'll live for God here. You know, as we see the challenges we face when we face sin and temptation, you know, there are sins and there are temptations we want to give in to. If we didn't want sin, if we didn't want temptation, they wouldn't be a temptation. But there are things we want to do that our fleshly body wants to enjoy and have pleasure in, but God says we can't do it and we have to know that God knows what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. And when we look at that idea and say, well, I want to do this, but I know if I don't do it, I've got this waiting for me. If I can refuse this, I've got a greater plan waiting. That's anticipation. The anticipation says, you know, I'll pass on this here because I know something better over here. It's sort of the idea of like an old science, psychology experiment they did with kids. Where they took a bunch of kids in a room and they told them, they said, here is a pile of marshmallows. If you want a marshmallow, you can have it now. Or you can wait an hour and you'll have a big bowl of ice cream. And you know those kids, they, they had a, a moral dilemma there. I want the marshmallow because I want it here now. I like ice cream better. But i got to wait for the ice cream. I'm going to have the marshmallow now. You see, that's our life as, uh, as people. We can choose the marshmallow, the sin here and now, and give up the ice cream, the, the blessing later. Or, and here's the idea of living for eternity. The eternity says, I know the ice cream's more. It's better. It's greater. I'll give this up. You see, we can go through sin and temptation knowing we got something better waiting for us. 
We can also, as we said a minute ago, go through the challenges of discouragement and loneliness. You know, if we've ever been at a point as a whole of the church, and I mean across the brotherhood, if ever been at a point where we deal with more loneliness and discouragement and separation, it's now, coming back from COVID. Because with this virus and what it caused us to do and what the decisions were made across the board, it has caused us to not be as united as we were before, and anybody can see that. Anybody can see before COVID, we were one way, and now we're a separate way. And look at how many people are affected by that. How many people now are lonely, discouraged, wandered away? Well, why? Because they let the temporary block their view from eternity. We know as Christians, when we look at eternity, yes, I may have loneliness here, but I've got a home waiting. I've got something better waiting. And then finally, we can face the challenge of death and separation. Again, as a preacher, I've said this over and over again. I'll continue to say, probably ask Don and Brother JC, and they'll agree with me. When I mean, you go to a funeral, and you go to a funeral, and you pay attention to the people, there is a marked difference between the, the, the funeral of a faithful Christian and a funeral of someone in the world. Someone in the world, the funeral is, is, may remember a few good things about them, and everybody really sort of looks around like, what are we supposed to say? How do we address this? As a preacher, you look and say, well, what do you want me to say? Knowing the life they lived, I'm talking about someone who didn't, never tried to come to God, never wanted to believe in God, refused to obey God. But then you go to that funeral of a Christian, and the phrase you hear over and over again, or some variant of it, is, oh, it's just goodbye for now. It is not gone forever. It's a temporary separation. Why? Because we have a view of eternity. When we have that view of eternity, we have a view that no one else has, a hope no one else has that no one else can give to us. And when we see this life, we can realize that truth because there's one more thing I want to look at before we go to our final slide. You see, we have to be careful. You know, I told you about the marshmallow and the ice cream. We have to be careful in our life. Because if we're not careful, we may become too attached to this world. We may become too attached to what's going to be destroyed. We may focus more on temporary than eternal. You see, Peter warns us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief when the heavens will pass away and with the roar, the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Jesus is coming like a thief in the night when no one prepares for it. Nobody's ready. It's going to come without warning. There's not going to be a time. You know, I remember one time in my young life as a young Christian, I was debating about the idea of baptism. I knew I needed to be baptized, but I wasn't quite ready for it yet. And I always had this thought, well, I wonder, if Jesus comes back before I'm baptized, if I hear the trumpet, will I have time to, to, to make a, a, dad, a bad rush, a, a quick rush to get to church, to get baptized before all that takes place? Is there something I can do? And the sad realization is no. It'll come in a moment. The twinkling of an eye, a split second. There'll be no second chance. There'll be no last second fix. It'll be pencils down, the test is over. Were you faithful or were you not? And if we're not careful, we can become too attached to this world. We become like Lot. Remember Lot? In Genesis chapter 19, the angels come to Lot. Couldn't find ten righteous souls in, in the city of, of Sodom. So what do they do? They come to Lot and tell Lot because of Abraham, God says, you can leave. You know, Lot, you know, you remember Lot? Lot just packed up and left, right? No, listen to the story again. Genesis 19, 15 and 16, as, mo as morning dawned and the angels urged Lot up, take your family, bring your two daughters, or take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. Verse 16, but he lingered. He lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and two daughters. By the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. Notice that idea. The angels told him, look, Lot, you've got to go. God's destruction is coming now. 
And what does Lot say? Well, I really don't want to leave. I really enjoy it here. Sodom is such a nice place. Yeah, the neighbors are a bit iffy, but, but, but I enjoy everything we got. I got all this stuff here. Lot's reluctant. We look at that story and we say, Lot, are you out of your mind? But do we not do the same thing? Do we not do the same thing when we look at this world and we value this world over God? We look at something and say, you know, I ought not do this, but I really enjoy this. I really want to do this. I, I, know, I'm not, I know I'm not supposed to. I know God tells me not to, but, but, but I really like it. I'm going to choose the temporary over eternal. Sometimes we are like the character in that story of Lot's story that we look down upon. Sometimes we're like Lot's wife. Lot was reluctant to leave. His wife looked back. In Genesis 19, verse 26, but Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. They knew what was coming. They knew what they had to do. But yet they refused to do it. Yet they refused to be, to do the things that were required to get out of punishment. They had to be forced. And here's the sad thing about it. God won't force us out of there. God won't force us to make the trip. It's our choice. It's our choice whether or not we are ready or not. You see, as Christians, we ought to long for eternity. We ought to long for the new heaven and the new earth. We ought to long for the place where righteousness dwells. Long for the time when death is destroyed. Long for the time when we will be with God forever. But we have to realize to get there, we have to be prepared. To get there, we have to live like God has called us to. You know, a few years ago, there was a country song out that had this line in it. The song, or the line was, that everybody wants to go to heaven, and nobody wants to go now. That sentiment, every time I hear that song, I, I have to smile and think about the sentiment of that song. That song says, everybody wants heaven. Everybody wants what's waiting but nobody wants to live for it. Nobody wants to live that life that's required to live to get to heaven. Very few do. The question this morning is, do we? I want to end with one last quote. Remember I started with Brother C.A. Wheeler's quote about brothers and sisters and fellow travelers from here to eternity. There's another quote that fits in with the topic we're looking at today, and that's Dave Ramsey's quote. Dave Ramsey's quote is about financial life here but also talks about spiritual life. Dave Ramsey is very fav very famous, and if you know anything about Dave Ramsey, you probably know this quote. Dave Ramsey has this quote that says, if you want to live, if you live like no one else now, later you can live like no one else. The idea is what he says is as a young person, if you'll go without certain things and save your money and pay off your debt and, and do what you're supposed to do, then when you're older, You'll be able to live like nobody else because you won't be scraping by. You'll have plenty of money. You'll have plenty in reserve. That also applies spiritually. Because we'll live like nobody else now and it will give up the passion of this life. We'll live for God. We'll follow God. We'll serve God. We'll obey God. Like no one else will now. One day we'll have a home of heaven. One day we'll have that eternity with God. The question I want to ask you this morning is, how are you living? Where's your focus? Do you focus on the here and now? Do you focus on the marshmallows, the immediate satisfaction, the immediate desires? Or are you looking at the ice cream, the eternal reward of heaven? You see, this world lives for the marshmallows. We need to live for the ice cream. We need to live for that greater thing, the thing of heaven that we prepare for, we anticipate, we are ready for. This morning I want to ask you, are you living a life that is ready for heaven? If you're not, I encourage you to change your life so that you are. If you're not a Christian, we encourage you to become one by putting him on that water grave of baptism. Or if you're a Christian who's stumbled, who's fallen away, change your life. Change your focus from the here and now, the, 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 the temporary to the eternal. Unless we focus on the eternal, unless we focus on heaven, unless we prepare for heaven, we'll never make it.
Remember Peter said that if you love to fly for a Christian, you add those things to your life, you're faithfully growing, faithfully developing, you made your calling and election sure, he said the gates of heaven are as wide as they'll ever be. The gates of heaven are either open for us or they're shut. The answer to that question is how we're living. This morning with your life as you're living for God, are the gates of heaven open or are they closed? They're only open if you're living in view of eternity. This morning, if you're not living in view of eternity, we encourage you to change your life so that you are. And we ask this morning that if you need anything, you'll come as together we stand and as we sing. Resolve no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten, hasten to him. Glad and free, hasten, glad and free. Jesus, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving the pen and shrine. He is a true one, he is a just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten, hasten to him. Glad and free, hasten, glad and free. Jesus, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the pass of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten, hasten to him, hasten so glad and free, hasten glad and free. Jesus, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Number 268. <laughs> I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, and thou my ransom be, and quick gone from the dead, I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? My Father's house of life, my glory serves. Oh, man. 
If you've not had the opportunity to uh, obtain a communion cup, please uh, raise your hand and someone will bring it to you. The scriptures tell us how we are to consider the Lord's Supper. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and given to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Our Father, as we take this bread, we remind ourselves that Christ gave his body as a sacrifice for our sins, bearing the curse of our sins upon his shoulders, that we might observe this memorial at the command of Christ. Amen. Likewise, in verse number 20, the cup after which they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. Let us pray. Our Father, as we take of this cup, we remember that Jesus shed his blood on the cross, that he might cleanse us from all unrighteousness, atoning for all our sins. Amen. Separate and apart from the taking of the communion, we use this opportunity to thank God for the blessings that he's given to us. In Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. Truly I tell unto you, he said to his disciples, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these gave up their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, has given all she had to live. Let us pray. Our Father, we acknowledge that you created all things and that you give us all things and that you sustain us each day. We ask that on this first day we might give back to you with a cheerful attitude and a purpose in our hearts to serve you and be devoted to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 